Hey guys, um, it's Emily here. I wanted to do a, an up close whisper video for you. Sorry if you just heard Micah making little noises. Um, I think I'm going to read from Hyperbole and a Half. Unfortunate situations, flawed coping mechanisms, mayhem, and other things that happened by Ali Brosh. Introduction Here is a recruit recreation of a drawing I did when I was five. It's a guy with one normal arm <coughs> and one absurdly fucking squiggly arm. If you look really closely, you can see the normal arm under the squiggly arm. What you can't see is that in the original, the squiggly arm continues for the entire length of a roll of butcher paper. It started on one end and then just kept going until I ran out of paper. I remember drawing it and thinking, this is insane. I can't even believe how long this guy's arm is. If I had not run out of paper, who knows what would have happened. In its entirety, the arm takes up more paper than this book. Theoretically, I could have cut the roll of butcher paper into squares, stapled them together, and then created squiggly arm book. I didn't, though. I considered that possibility, but in the end, I decided I couldn't realistically expect to get away with it. Warning signs. When I was 10 years old, I wrote a letter to my future self and buried it in my ba backyard. 17 years later, I remembered that I was supposed to remember to dig it up two years earlier. I looked forward to getting the a nostalgic glimpse into my childhood. <clears throat> Perhaps I would marvel at my own innocence and see the first glimmer of my current aspirations. As it turns out, it just made me feel real weird about myself. The letter was scrolled in green crayon on the back of a utility bill. My ten-year-old self had obviously not spent <clears throat> too much time planning out the presentation of it. Most likely, I had simply been walking through the kitchen and suddenly realized that it was entirely possible to write a letter to my future self. <clears throat> the overwhelming excitement of this realization probably caused me to panic and short circuit, making me unable to locate proper writing implements. I did, however, manage to fade through the haze of chaos and impulse long enough to find a crayon stub and a paper surface to mash it against. The letter begins thusly. Dear 25-year-old, no, not dear 25-year-old me or dear 25-year-old self, just dear 25-year-old. Do you still like dogs? What is your favorite dog? Do you have a job training dogs? Is Murphy still alive? What's your favorite food? Are mom and dad still alive? I feel it's important to know the order of those questions. Obviously, dog-related subjects are my chief concern. Murphy was my family's dog followed closely by the need to know my future favorite food. I feel that the double question mark speaks to how important I thought that question was. Only then did I pause to wonder whether my parents had survived. Priorities, dogs, 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 specific dog, food, lifespan of parents. The letter continues with a section titled about me. My name is Allie and I'm 10 years old. I have blonde hair and blue eyes. My favorite dog is a German Shepherd. My second favorite dog is a husky. My third favorite dog is a Doberman Pinscher. This is troubling for a number, number of reasons. The first of which is that I apparently thought my future self wouldn't be aware of my name or eye color. The second thing is the fact that I just tacked on my favorite dog breeds at the end there. Like it was every bit as important to my identity as the other things. As if my past self had imagined my future self standing in the yard of the upturned earth, clutching my letter and screaming, what dogs did I like? How am I supposed to understand my identity without knowing what dogs I liked when I was 10? I took a break from writing at that point to draw several pictures of what appeared to be a German Shepherds. 
Below the German Shepherds, I wrote the three most disturbing words in the entire letter. Three words that revealed more about my tenuous grasp on reality than anything else I've uncovered about my childhood. There at the bottom of the letter, I had taken the crayon stub and used it to craft the following sentence. Please write back. Judging by the thick, purposeful lines in each letter, I was applying a truly impressive amount of pressure to the crayon. The sincerity of the request is unmistakable. When I asked my future self what my favorite dog is, or whether mom and dad were still alive, I actually expected to get answers. And apparently I still expected to be 10 years old when I got those answers. Please write back. I imagine writing, I imagine myself patiently standing in the yard day after day thinking, any time now, it's going to happen. Soon, I just know it. Time travel is a complex subject that I don't expect a 10 year old to fully understand. But this is more than just a basic misunderstanding of time travel. I'm almost definitely not a time traveler, but in case I am, I decided to write back. In fact, I decided to write letters to several iterations of my past self because I felt there were important things that I could explain to myself or things I could warn myself about. Allow me to begin with a letter to my two-year-old self. Dear two-year-old, face cream is not edible no matter how much it looks like frosting. No matter how many times you try, it's always going to be face cream and it's never going to be frosting. I promise I won't lie to you about this. It's honestly never going to be frosting. For the love of fuck, please stop. I need those organs you're ruining. Dear four-year-old, allow me to preface this by saying I don't know why you started eating salt in the first place, but regardless of the precipitating circumstances, there you are. As soon as you became aware that eating huge amounts of the salt is really, really uncomfortably salty, you should have stopped eating salt. That's the solution. The solution is not to begin eating pepper to cancel out the salt. You've found yourself in this predicament several times now, every time you get trapped in this totally preventable cycle. You've done more than enough experimenting to come to the conclusion that pepper is not the opposite of salt all by yourself, but somehow you seem to remain stubbornly un unaware of this fact. To reiterate, no matter how much pepper you eat, you won't undo the ludicrous amount of salt you ate before. The only thing you are accomplishing by eating pepper is making your mouth taste like pepper and salt. Similarly, switching back to salt again won't cancel out the burning from the pepper that you ate to cancel out the original salt. How is this so difficult to understand? You can stop whenever you want to. As a side note, you really need to start learning from your mistakes. Believe me, I know what happens when you discover electric fences next year and you could do without the seventh volt of electricity. Dear five-year-old, what the fuck is wrong with you? Normal children don't have dead imaginary friends. Normal children don't pick open every single one of their chicken pox scabs and then stand naked and bleeding in the darkened doorway of their bedroom until someone walks past and asks what they are doing. Furthermore, normal children don't respond to saying, I wanted to know what all my blood would look like. Normal children also don't watch their parents sleep from the corner of the room. Mom was really scarred by the exorcist when she was younger and she doesn't know how to cope with your increasingly creepy behavior. Please stop, please, please stop. Dear six-year-old, you're having an absurdly difficult time learning the letter R. You practice all the time, and you've mastered every other letter in the alphabet, both uppercase and lowercase, but for reasons beyond my comprehension, R just destroys you. How do you mess something up that badly? The first one is understandable, but what's going on with that middle one? How did the extra protrusion get there? And look at the tiny one on the right. That one has four protrusions. I'm not an expert on protrusions. That's way too many. I think if you took some time to relax and really look at the letter R, you'd see it's not nearly as complicated as you're making it. Dear seven-year-old, look at the other children around you. Do you see how they're wearing clothing? That's because they're seven years old and they've all realized that it's no longer appropriate to take their clothes off in public. You haven't realized that, have you? People have tried to explain it to you. Your teachers have tried. Your parents have tried. Even the other students have expressed discomfort with your persistent and inexplicable nakedness. But you just don't stop. Why do you want to be naked so badly? 
Do you even know why? Are you overtaken by forces beyond your control that make you do this? Regardless, clothing is a reality that you need to accept. There are no loopholes to this. You can't take your clothes off and hide in the corner hoping no one notices. You can't trick the teachers into letting you be naked by burying yourself in the sandbox. Your clothes are in a pile next to you. You know. They know. Dear 10-year-old, Wow, you really like dogs. In fact, you like dogs so much that I'm not even sure it's emotionally healthy. It might be normal to love dogs a lot, or to be really interested in dogs. We go way, way past that. Normal children don't walk around pretending to be a dog nearly as much as you do. For example, you're 10. It makes people wonder about your developmental progress and you growl and bark at them. An even more concerning issue is the obstacle course. Fine, you want to train your dog to run through an obstacle course. That's pretty normal. What isn't normal is making your mother take you, oh, time you as you crawl through the course on all fours over and over and over again. You're making mom think that she did something wrong to make you this way. Now that we've gotten that out of the way, allow me to answer your questions. Do you still like dogs? Yes, but not as much as you do. I've developed a healthy relationship with dogs. What's your favorite dog? I don't know. This may come as a surprise to you, but knowing exactly where each dog breed ranks on my list of my favorites isn't the pressing issue that it used to be. Do you have a job, job training dogs? No, I can't even train my own dogs, let alone the dogs of other people. Is Murphy still alive? Of course not. I don't know whether you're being optimistic or you don't actually understand that dogs don't live to be 25, but you've really set yourself up for a lot of disappointment there. What's your favorite food? Nachos, which is fortunate because in the future you're dysfunctional and you don't take care of yourself so you end up eating a whole lot of nachos. Are mom and dad still alive? Actually, you turned out to be Batman so we had to put them down for storyline purposes. Dear 13 year old, I think everyone was relieved when you started to grow out of your unhealthy obsession with dogs. Unfortunately, now you think you're a wizard. I know this because I found your collection of spells. Tell me, how does mixing Dijon mustard with sand and then eating it make someone love you? First of all, I think your extensive and early experiences with ingesting non-food substances will put you off at attempting something like this. Secondly, no one is going to love you until you stop doing things like trying to make them love you by eating mustard sand. Dear other iterations of my past self, thank you for not being so goddamn weird that I felt I had to address you personally in a letter from the future. I commend you. So I'm going to stop right there. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it made you sleepy and relaxed. It made you forget all the stresses of your day. I love you. Sleep well, okay? I'll see you soon.